All right, here we go. I'll show you the cover. <clears throat> Here we go. Let me see. Got it. Well, folks, friends, we are so happy to welcome everybody to the presentation of this beautiful book, which is just about to land in our hands. <laughs> the artwork is exquisite. Those of you who know Tom <laughs> know that. And his stories are just, oh, they're just precious little vignettes of, of his life before Baba as a child in Woodstock. And then, and then, uh, oh my goodness, so many stories coming to Baba and his, his life with the Mandalay and interact. Oh, it's, it's, it's a real treasure. So we're very glad you're here. And uh, Kathy has been uh, heart and soul doing these great presentations. This will be the fourth one now. She's taking a few chapters at a time um, and uh, introducing you to this wonderful book by and a tribute to her husband, Tom, who passed in last February. Okay, Kathy, you take it from here. <clears throat> thank you, Betty. Thank you. First, thank you, Betty. Thank you, Ruth, for all your help and uh, technical support and emotional support as I present these four parts of Tom's, the cover of the chapters in Tom's book. And today is going to be uh, an enjoyment of chapters seven and eight, which begin after the East-West gathering and run through the end up until you know tom's finished the book so chapter seven and eight here we go uh greg wonderful help that we got from greg butler just a few months before tom passed he came and we recorded these videos of tom sharing photos from the book so today greg has put together what we have called part four which is as i say after the East West gathering from, you know, basically 1963 uh, to the present. So that's where we'll begin. So after returning from the East-West gathering, it was difficult to carry on with the incredible presence of Baba within you that he had instilled. And this pencil drawing was an example of that, what would you call this? This, the experience of balancing your life, your day-to-day -day life, the challenge of that, 
at the same time remembering the intensity of his experience, the experience of his presence within you. So what does this mean to you? What did it mean to you at that time? One has resigned within oneself to put the focus of life on maintaining spiritual balance and apprehension of Baba's presence near oneself and within oneself. And here is Woodstock, New York. Mm -hmm. my hometown. This has such a nice artistic feel. Does it indicate a maverick there? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the maverick is indicated here, which is where you and Yvonne built your first home. Yeah, I built. Yeah, my home. You had a Reproduction of my home. Yes, that's coming up next. Uh, this also shows the seahorse where you would frequent and some of the wonderful stories from the book happened there. So many important people in my life also gathered there. Mm. Um, the Art Students League Summer School where your teacher Walter Goldst had taught long before me. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bird Cliff, which was where the founder of One Woodstock. Of the earliest of the Woodstock art colonies. So this is a very historic map. You and Yvonne. This is the very first house I built entirely by myself. And I remember you have said that you took books out of the library to learn how to build a house. With satisfactory instructions and the basic processes of building. And I'm so I, I created the plan. With Yvonne, I'm sure. She, and also she he helped. Mm -hmm. yeah. She did not help in the building. Building, but she was an excellent um, plan layout. It did take layout. a considerable amount of time, mm -hmm. close to a year. I remember you have said that you actually at first had no electricity, so you were using a handsaw. Yeah. Initially, very right. rustic conditions. Hands, handsaws and equipment used in the process of building. So, let's see, that was in 63, 64, and you already knew Phyllis and Lynn Ott through the Artists Association. Maybe because they were members of the Woodstock Artists Association. I didn't know them intimately, but I realized that they were very receptive to my way of thinking on, in many areas. So I informed them, or they inquired from me, mm -hmm. what they had heard about Mayor Baba. Phyllis first, and she came and borrowed books after you got back yeah. from the East-West Gathering. They took Baba very, very seriously and engaged themselves in a very close study of what he had to say about the life of the spirit. So Phyllis went to see Baba first, even though he was in seclusion. She actually yeah. got in touch with the people in India. Baba was was living in India and created and then actuated a trip to India. Lynn 
would not accompany her. She went entirely on her own and met Mayor Baba in India. He gave her a variety of instructions. She returned with a, with a great deal of information which she communicated to her husband, Lynn, and, and to myself as well. So when Lynn and Phyllis went back to India together, after Baba said to Phyllis, return and bring Lynn with you, Baba shone a bright flood light upon himself so that Lynn could see him better. Was, he wasn't entirely blind. He wasn't entirely blind, so he could see Baba with a bright light. Up close. Mm -hmm. And then Baba took a photo box um, and opened it and gave a large photograph of himself mm -hmm. to Lynn to contemplate. And then he took a second photo out of the box. And here you see Baba gesturing. What is that? What is happening? So he said, give this to Tom. That photo was the photo that he asked himself. of himself that he asked mm -hmm. Lynn to give to you. As I a, do recall now. Mm -hmm. It's in the living room. It's in our living room to this day. Mm -hmm. The photo still. And I think it's interesting that you have said you feel that this photo that Baba gave Lynn to give to you had a very special meaning. This particular photo with Baba with his eyes closed. That's really interesting how you have felt that had special meaning to you. You felt Baba was giving you a message through that. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Talk more about that. Well, what he had essentially taught, that the ultimate purpose of life is to reveal God's presence within yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are similar photos with Baba's eyes open, but this particular photo shows Baba's eyes closed, which you felt meant for you to the, the kingdom of heaven. His kingdom was within you. Such a memorable gift. You must have been so thrilled when Lynn presented it to you. Yeah, such a revelation. So the Winterfelds were such wonderful friends and coordinators in the Baba community. And this little note is very touching because I'm curious about that. in Fred's brown ink, you see he's created a little logo. You see it says Tom Yvonne. Lynn Phyllis in Baba. So Fred and Ella were celebrating that connection. Isn't that nice? <clears throat> he was happy. They were happy for you and Yvonne finding another couple who really discovered Baba and resonated and loved Baba too. Could share such a meaningful, fascinating discovery. I remember you have said that you were surprised up to that point that you had told, you and Yvonne had meetings and had told many people, but so few really became interested and the Ots were such receptive people and what a joy that was. Well, that had been subtly going on within themselves for such a long time. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It was not a new direction for them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> a fulfillment of the direction they had begun mm-hmm. years before. A spiritual direction. Mm-hmm. Another amazing story in the book has to do with your connection with Peter Whitehead, who was the son of Ralph Radcliffe Whitehead, the founder of the Woodstock Art Colony. Yeah. And one day Peter called and said, could you bring a car of a Mrs. Leggett back to her estate in Stone Ridge and said... Peter tells me that you're connected to Meher Baba. Mm -hmm. And then she told you that who had come and stayed at that estate when her mother was alive. Vivekananda. Vivekananda. The disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. And you were so astounded that Vivekananda had come to this estate so close to Woodstock and then she this is the house where Vivekananda was housed so she brought you to this and because Baba had spoken so fondly <clears throat> of both those individuals mm-hmm. of yes Ramakrishna and his close one so she got up from the the gathering and said, would you like to see the house where Vivekananda stayed? And of course, instantly you said, oh, yes, this is where Vivekananda stayed in 1895. Okay. So here is Vivekananda with some of his monks and Mrs. Leggett is the woman oh, sitting yeah. Mm-hmm. sort of in the middle of the photo with a square bodice. And that was the mother of Miss, the Mrs. Leggett who told you that Vivekananda had actually stayed there. This photograph is the very building which was built in 1873. <laughs> Initially, it was a Initially, country store. A country store and a gathering place with a theatrical space upstairs, large living quarters on the far left end. And it became, I purchased the property on an important corner near the large reservoir, one of New York City's very very important reservoirs in Shokan, New York, Mm -hmm. about seven miles from Woodstock. So in 1966, you and Yvonne purchased this old country store and renovated it. Yes, and it turned into my... uh, antique establishment so my my home as well and of course since it was on a main road it became extremely successful very important business myself my wife and one of my small children named Mm damien And standing to my right, Christina, my daughter. And you started having, you and Yvonne started having Baba gatherings there. Every week, every Monday evening. And there was a small group that gathered every Monday. Came from all of them living in the extended area near Woodstock. And I'm sure you were renovating away, so here you are. The process of restoring various parts of this same building. 
Christina said she remembered that cap very well, and she made you the cap that you're wearing on your head. <laughs> <laughs> this poster was on one of the posts near your the post office cage where you stood. Within the large, immense room, which formed my antique shop. True Amazing. There's no game of the faint hearted and the weak. It is born of strength and understanding. This has been stated by Mayor Baba. And a, <clears throat> an amazing visitor came, Garth Hudson came in one day. This poster was seen by many who came yeah, many, in. Many people. It was present as you opened the two store doors there in front of you on a large support post was this. You have said that one day Garth Hudson, who was in Bob Dylan's band, who often frequented your antique shop, came in with another fellow, and Garth went off hunting for antiques, and the fellow who remained looking at the photo of the, the poster of Mayor Baba started speaking to you about Mayor Baba and and he said, and he had an English accent. I think it's wonderful to just begin by saying that he said, I've read the discourses, I've read God Speaks, now I've become very familiar with the messages of Mayor Baba. And I particularly like what Mayor Baba said about, in the discourses, the formation of sanskaras. Of the growth and development of sanskaras or impressions. And how they limit our... Limit one's spiritual development. He went on and on, and you thought, he knows a lot about... He knows, I'm surprised he knows a great deal about what Mayor Baba had to say about the spiritual life. So then you said something that he appreciated. He came around the little post office cage, the swinging little door there, and gave you a big hug and said... I'm so glad we met. Unfortunately, I have to go back to London. Otherwise, I would like to get to know you a little more. But it's been a joy. It's been so nice to talk to you about Mayor Baba. It's been so fulfilling to me. I remember that. He was naturally very conscious. Well, a few days later, Garth Hudson came back and said, How did you like? How did you like George? And you thought, George, oh, yes, that was the Englishman. George Harris. And yeah. the reason you didn't recognize George Harrison was because. You were a devotee of Mozart and Bach and Beethoven, and his music was a different style. But you had no idea who he was, but you had a wonderful... Yeah, I was a classical music lover. So I've always wondered, when Garth said, how did you like George? And then you ask again, and he said, George Harrison, did you realize then who he... Oh, yes, I would heard of him. You would have heard of him. But I always assumed that he must have been so happy to talk to you about what he was really interested in. Yeah, he was. He uh, became more and more serious, and more and more people were influenced by what he had perceived. Mm -hmm. The last chapter of your 
story of your life story begins with the announcement of Baba's dropping his physical body in 19... 1969. And here is Guru Prasad. You and Yvonne and the children were able to go to India after Baba dropped his body for the last darshan in April of 69, where you gathered for that momentous event. And this is a photo of the darshan attendees gathered at the Bombay airport after the darshan was over. Is It's interesting that quite Soon after Mayor Baba dropped his physical body, the Woodstock Festival took place. So important. So many musical functions that mm -hmm. serve the spiritual world in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And of course, since Baba did drop his body in January, and this was mid August, quite soon after Baba. 69. And so Bruce Hoffman and a number of others organized a Baba tent so that there was a Mayor Baba presence prevailing. And Baba's posters and photos mm -hmm, were <clears throat> shown, and some movies which included these posters and cards and photos of Baba really were seen all over the world. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the posters that was shown and sold at the at the Woodstock Festival, the well, front I, and the back. As a much younger man. Mm-hmm. In that previous photo. Mm-hmm. Different beautiful quotations of Baba were printed on the back if people wanted to buy such a poster, and Elaine Cox actually designed this little large card, oh, small poster, that. and that's another another of the posters that she designed. The earlier image. Mm -hmm. With that wonderful hippie lettering that also I think people saw all over the world at that time. Then after the 69 a photo of myself outside of my mm -hmm. vast property in Woodstock. Mm -hmm. So you and Yvonne sold the antique store and bought land in 1970 that you developed and you called that? Mayor Circle. Mayor Circle. I think there were how many? 27 homes? I don't remember. I think that I had built. It's about 10 miles from the heart of Woodstock. So this was the uh, entrance to Meher Circle, which was the subdivision that you and Vaughn developed mm -hmm. and from 1970 to about 75. There are Baba meetings held there uh, that you and Yvonne held. Also Monday nights, were they? Monday, yeah. And... Uh, Sometimes Darwin and Jean would come down from Schenectady. People came from surprising distances. Fast forward to the mid 80s. We started to date and married in 1986. And then in 1996, we moved to Asheville. And here is a picture of you painting. Hmm. I think it was 2003 in Asheville. So we're coming into the present time. You look like you've just created a man masterpiece <laughs> or about to. <laughs> Tom and his easel. And Chris Barker took this lovely photo of you at one of the Southeast gatherings at which you were a guest speaker holding up the pamphlet that you first saw and then were given by oh. Raoul in 
Woodstock in 1954. So here you are after your talk at the Southeast Gathering showing the pamphlet that initiated your interest in Baba. And you had just been, looks like, telling some tall tales. <laughs> Having been left money by several multimillionaires. Having been what? Left Money and by money by severed. But that's why you're smiling. Mm -hmm. I see. And there we are. Well, the woman who took me over. Yes, that's right, Catherine. <laughs> that's me. I tell you. She had power over me. Yes. We were out at Caesar's Head, and Tom's nephew took a photo of us, and that Baba had oh, been. Remember, Baba had been so beautiful there. there. Mm. So that was bringing everybody up to the present time. I think this is such a beautiful image that you created. That's off the coast of Western Ireland. Mm -hmm. Tell about this lovely painting of yours. Yeah, I created it. And this image of Baba rowing into this ocean of love mm -hmm. contains is that? the last young man jumping in is that's you. Oh yeah, that's Tom. That's Tom. Dear Baba, happy. It's wonderful that Tom was, you know, so present so shortly before his passing. It's wonderful to see those photos and those, hear those stories again from him. And I, I thought it would be absolutely wonderful to read a little bit from the um what tom wrote about the 69 darshan that is very interesting before i ask three friends to share memories of life with the rileys in woodstock in the late 60s into the mid 70s but it it's interesting because the 69 darshan was so monumental for so many people Yet for Tom, he had a very different experience. Uh, we got permission to have him include Bal Natu's short paragraph on Bal Natu's feeling after he experienced the East West Gathering. And Tom, upon reading that, felt it was so much similar to his own experience that we got permission to use it in Tom's book. So this is Balnatu's writing from Intimate Times with Meher Baba at Guru Prasad. Since the great event of beloved Baba's dropping the body, a strange experience of inner void, wherein there is neither delight nor sorrow, possessed me for some time. I was as if anesthetized during the Darshan program of 1969, though I felt Baba's presence. I watched for the most part as an observer in the background. Naturally, there was grief and despair that he had left us, but I knew he remained within me. I continued to experience him. I must say that the recollection of the entire experience of having been a part of this event in India was not one laden with sorrow because my psychic state was not one of having lost something. It was rather part of an evolving awareness that through his existence within me, an undiscovered reality awaited its revelation, which would in the course of time 
direct my life toward a positive purpose and a practical fulfillment as my relationship with Baba evolved and manifested. To continue with reminiscences from three wonderful friends of Tom and Yvonne's who early on began to attend their meetings in first uh, at Winchell's country store, the antique shop, and later at Mayher Circle, I would love to ask these three friends whose reminiscences we included in Tom's book, I'd like to ask them to read their beautiful memories. And I'd love to ask Joyce Barrison to begin. Welcome, Joyce. Hi. Um, God, yeah, it's really, this was really nice, Kathy. Uh, yeah, seeing Tom, that was, that was really, really nice. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, okay. So she, Kathy wanted me to do a short introduction. Yeah. I, um, well, I, I met, you'll hear, I'll, I'll read the thing that was in, in the book. Um, but Tom, Tom was a really important person to me. I mean, I, I myself came to Baba in, in uh, 68 and, and I went on the Darshan. Um, and then I lived near Woodstock. So I got to spend some time with him and Yvonne. Um, that was really, really special for me. It really was. Uh, I, there are no words, so I'll just read what was written in the book. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so my husband, I was I'm Joyce Barrison, my husband was David Barrison. Um, so my husband David and I were living on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in a slum. Uh, we found out about Baba in January of 68. Um, we met Cindy, uh, who was then Cindy Dacek. Um, and I think we met Tom and Yvonne in Woods. We did. I I don't think I know. Yeah, we met Tom and Yvonne in Woodstock before going to the sixty nine Darshan. Um, yeah, uh, we ended up moving to Woodstock uh, after the Darshan. Uh, we were new to Baba. We also met Tom and Yvonne. You know, again, we saw them at the sixty nine Darshan, of course. Um, and and this I I I, re I remember this. I mean I can see it. I, I remember this. I'll never forget this. I remember walking into Winchell's Corners antique store, and there were all these old things. It wasn't bright or lit up, but I remembered seeing Tom. <laughs> it makes me cry. Oh God. Yeah. I, I mean I saw his face, and it, it was like a beacon. I mean his like his smile. Mm. And um, when he would laugh, <laughs> and, he, and you could even see that just a tiny bit when he said that thing, uh, uh, when he was talking to Kathy just now about somebody giving him a lot of money, um, you know, he, he just, uh, there was just nothing like it. I mean, really, <laughs> you know, and, and he, you know, he, Tom was um, like understated to say the least, you know, like, I mean, he would, he would talk. And he'd be saying something that seemed very, very serious, but it would always have some kind of humor in it. And then he would just break out in this laugh. Oh, God. Anyway, and so coming into Winchell's Corners like that, I remember seeing him and his face was like a beacon, his smile. Yeah, he would tell a joke and his whole face would light up. And, you know, of course he was serious. He could be serious too, but there was something about him that always seemed so amazing to me. And Baba just radiated through everything. And um, just watching him today just reminded me of that. You know, that was the thing. I don't know what it is, but like, I wish I had it. It's just this, I mean, he was, his life was Baba. I mean, that was just what I always felt. And it had, it made a great impression on me. Um, Tom and Yvonne had meetings at their house and the meetings were small. 
yeah, which was amazing. When I think back now, how lucky I was to be there, my God, they were really small. I mean, just me, um, yeah, I say here, I recall Tom, Yvonne, Cindy, Michael Cernitsky was this guy who lived up in Woodstock, my husband, David, and me, that was it. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, like we had, and it was such a beautiful room. And the rug that's in that room, um, he still has. <laughs> and and not, you know, within the year before he died, I, um, I, I was talking to Tom and Kathy, I guess, about the book and everything. And I can't remember. I I don't remember if she sent me a picture or what. But but I saw the room that he was in, and that same rug was there. It was the same rug that was there during those uh, meetings. Yeah, um, that was right after Baba dropped his body. Yeah, all was new, and at that time it felt like something was happening. Tom seemed to be into that. Yeah, there was this thing. We were all expecting a Maha Pralaya, the final reabsorption into God, and he he was he was really into that. Um, we we all were. I mean, we 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 wanted it to happen, um, but of course, I think the Maha Pralaya is just the continuing of having to live out our lives. <laughs> oh my God, very difficult task. All right, so we had these meetings, and though they were not large, it was really exciting. I also remember meeting with them casually at their round kitchen table, and we'd be sitting there, and Tom would be telling all these stories. I remember the feeling of listening to Tom's stories of how he heard about Baba, and also about his times with Baba. Tom seemed like such an ethereal creature. He was so powerful and palpable. I felt so fortunate that I was there. Um, at the Baba meetings, there would be readings and not so much the storytelling as there had been when we'd sit casually around the kitchen table. Uh, Tom and Yvonne's life was crazy. They were always building, living in the middle of chaos, always a project which prevailed. But Tom would sit down and start talking about Baba and there would just be this calm. It was just amazing. I mean, like there like, it, it was just really total chaos around them. Um, but when we sit at that table, it was just like there was no time. And it was just being in, it was truly just being in the moment. It was really wonderful. Um, I called Tom recently. I hadn't talked to him in many years. I asked if from the time he had found out about Baba had anything changed. He said, I still think of Baba every day. Nothing has changed. He said that his focus had been centered on Baba then, and it's the same way now. It hadn't changed. That's it. Thank you, Joyce. That yeah. brings us all back. It feels very magical. That's really a treasure to hear. Oh, wow, what a wonderful beginning. So Michael Siegel also had attended Baba meetings at Tom and Yvonne's and we asked if he would share his reminiscences. And so Michael, welcome. Oh, oh. Okay, can you hear? Good. Yes, great. All right, this is terrific. Thank you for inviting me to share my feelings and my thoughts. So I'm just going to read directly from the piece that you asked me to, because I know time is running. Uh, I'll just say that Tom was, is a very important presence in my life. Um, really formative and really, in a way, a compadre on many levels, in many ways, he would pop up at very important junctures in my life. I'll just read here. As a teenager, I came into Meher Baba's contact in the autumn of 1970, and I lived in the village of New Paltz, New York, not far from Woodstock. I met Tom and Yvonne soon after becoming connected to Baba and I started to regularly attend meetings at their home. 
I would also drive weekly to Darwin and Jean's meetings in Schenectady. So that was my schedule. Being a musician, an artist, and a seeker myself, I found that I was easily drawn to Tom's sense of aesthetics. And I was quite naturally in tune with how he would describe his own experiences. A significant dimension of my connection with and love for Tom revolves around our shared sense of art and beauty, especially his sensitivity, humor, and artful ways with nuanced descriptive language of experience. The power of his storytelling and his spectacular flair for the dramatic captured me, as well as many others. Almost anyone who has heard Tom tell the story knows him to be a most fabulous raconteur. As an artist, he was ecstatically attuned to many of the kinds of aspirations and the motivations that I also felt. And being younger than many other Baba people in those days, he was a kind of generational bridge for me. Tom was a strong and graceful individual and who by virtue of his own artistic sen sensitivities and also having lived in Woodstock, he was a living a kind of counterculture of his own. Thinking about this now, Tom represented a special kind of validation that confirmed what I and many of my generation were seeking, a new way of living apart from the mainstream of society. We were moving into a new and different life of inner abundance with Baba that left behind many of the earliest stages of cultural re rebellion. Most of the devotees who had met Baba, such as the Shaws and the Winterfelds, were of an older generation. They so generously accepted us and they inspired us. And yet Tom was culturally more ours in many ways, closer and quite familiar. For many of us young people who found ourselves at those Meher Circle meetings, he represented and held the space for those who were outgrowing our old lifestyle. And in his own way, he mirrored what many were actually seeking, a fuller flowering of the inner experiential spiritual life than Meher Baba so emphasized and transmitted. And as a Meher Baba mentor, Tom occupied and embodied the possibility of being in this new mystical and spiritualized Meher Baba world, while still knowing perfectly well the inclinations of the culture that we, us people, were coming out of. The Woodstock meetings were a nest of comfort, validation, and possibility. And they were fun. Imagine the feeling of coming down a quiet country road on a weekday evening, and then seeing a sign for Mayor Circle. Just imagine that. And one would then enter a house in a forest, all wood and glass that Tom had designed and built. It was an artistic work in itself. At the meetings, the format usually started with a reading, perhaps something from the Awakener magazine or a letter or message from Elizabeth Patterson or another close disciple. The feeling was casual, light, inviting. We would feel free to share thoughts and insights to be at ease in responding or commenting on what was being read. This was usually followed by the centerpiece of the gathering, a more serious reading or message. Often one of Baba's discourses was read or a section of God speaks. As two of the few Westerners, as two of the few Westerners who had direct experience of being with Mary Baba, Tom and Yvonne were of course would of course share their own stories of being with him. A poem or quotation might be recited and there would invariably be musical offerings by different people. I also might share a song on guitar or play my sitar. 
we would always end with a few moments of silence, a short meditation, trying to connect inwardly with Mayor Baba. Then Yvonne would serve tea and we'd be in the kitchen. It was always light. There was as well an extra dimension of being surrounded with art at those meetings, including Tom's paintings, vibrant with color, highly symbolic. That became yet another way of expanding one's understanding of how Baba would work with individuals. There's so much storytelling in his works, images that were really narratives of people in the midst of some important moment or occurrence. I would think, yes, in this painting, he rescues me. Yes, here's someone in the dark forest and there's Baba just ahead. Or here they're drowning and Baba is coming in a boat, rescuing them. Art helps us to translate and to understand experience. And all of this was part of my early steps in coming into life with Mayor Baba. Remembering the atmosphere and the feeling of the gatherings at Meher Circle, the different phases of the evening, stories, readings, poetry, music, one could certainly glean Tom's artistic touch in helping to compose them. There was a definite sense of attempting to integrate different qualities of Mayor Baba's reality into the structure of those meetings, a format that I and others have adopted for our own gatherings. The Mayor Baba, the, the meetings at Mayor Circle in Woodstock were an important aspect of my own early connection with and experience of Baba. And coming when they did in my own spiritual life were in retrospect, really formative. So that's my piece. And Thank you. Yeah. Wow, that really is a wonderful, wonderful testament. Joyce and Michael, these are wonderful. Thank you. And it's such a wonderful um, segue into our next reader, Greg Parentoni, who was one of the workers who helped construct the homes that became Mayor Circle. So Greg is really uh, perfectly placed here. And Greg, thank you for joining us also. And thank you, Michael, for that beautiful reading, sharing. So Greg Parentoni, welcome to our gathering. Good to go now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I'll just read what I wrote here. Um, an oil painter I knew, a Mayor Baba lover, once showed me a painting she had done. It was the painting of a young man with feet on planet Earth, with an exaggerated long tall body and a head in the clouds. I told her it was a nice painting and she replied that it was a painting of me or partly of me. She told me that if I that I had my head in the clouds, but now in order to be useful to myself or anyone else, I would have to get my feet planted on the ground. Looking back now, I realize she was right. For reasons only Mayor Baba knows, he decided to assign a part of the unenviable task of grounding me to Tom Riley. Tom and his wife at the time, Yvonne, had purchased a piece of land in Woodstock and had plans of building houses on it. The piece of land would eventually become a circular road of houses called Mayher Circle, but at the time it was just wild land. I would eventually work on cutting a path for the road and on many of the houses with Tom Yvonne. If you were a Mayor Baba lover or even newly interested in Mayor Baba as I was, and you lived near Woodstock, you knew of Tom Riley and Lina. Lynn, uh, Lynn had moved to Myrtle Beach before I came to Baba. Tom was still there. One evening, there was a knock on my apartment door. And when I opened it, to my surprise, there stood a man who introduced himself as Tom Riley. 
he had heard that I was interested in learning about Meher Baba and brought some things for me to read. I was amazed that he had tracked me down. That was late 1969. And strangely, I don't recall much contact with Tom for the next couple of years until I started working for him. Of course, at that time, Meher Baba had completely taken over my life, had torn it down and was building it up back up brick by a brick. I think that was around 1972 when I started actually working with Tom. Funny thing, when I first got interested in Eastern religions, I had this image of spiritual seekers sitting quietly near some stream so peacefully with their thoughts in some faraway la-la land. Now here I was side by side with someone who had sat at the feet of the Christ of the age, someone who Meher Baba had summoned by name, and Tom was up to his neck in sawdust, building inspectors, dealing with subcontractors and juggling finances to pay back loans. Mayher's Baba's sense of humor, I'm sure. Tom was a talented craftsman and house designer who took pride in his work. Still, I got the distinct feeling that he would have preferred using his talents to do oil painting. I could tell that Tom was working very hard on him at the time. I saw that he and Yvonne were under a lot of pressure and was quite amazed at how poised they always seemed to be. I was sure that Mayher Baba was a source of that poise. It was very rare that our conversations would turn to Mayor Baba in those days. Most of the talk was about what, had, what trim had to be completed, what lumber had to be cut, what wall had to be painted, and other such things. However, it was understood that all these pressing activities were Baba's will, and not much more needed to be said about it. When we did talk about Mayor Baba, it seemed that most of the talk was about how Baba wanted us to attend faithfully to our worldly duties without complaint. Without it being said out loud, I knew that those conversations were designed to make me aware that it was something I needed to work on. A strange thing sometimes happens when you work day by day alongside someone. You develop a familiarity, a feeling of being on some sort of equal ground. The fact that Tom is such an unassuming person added to that feeling. It was often only after work that I would be struck by the fact that I was working with someone who had recognized God in human form at a young age, someone who God himself had drawn to his side, someone who had sat at God's feet, someone who indeed was part of a very special club, a club that most people didn't even know exists. I am very fortunate and frankly quite amazed that my life intersected with Tom's, and I thank you, Mayor Baba, for that. Thank you. Thanks, Gray. That's very touching. Oh, make her circle. Mm. And to think Michael was involved in meetings at those houses you helped to build. Yeah. And it's it's a wonderful continuation to this day of love and devotion for Baba that unfolded from those days and of course from before so thank you all three of you joyce michael greg for reading your reminiscences that will be included in tom's book mm. so we're going to end our little presentation with two i, I call them snippets from past talks that tom gave at the baba center You know, I'm still, I still have this attachment for Ramakrishna. Now, Meher Baba loved Ramakrishna, and he actually went all the way to the temple where Ramakrishna lived, north of Calcutta, in a place called Dakshineshwar. 
And as you, if you know anything about Ramakrishna, you know that <clears throat> his key disciple, the disciple died when he was only 39, his name was Vivekananda. Baba called Vivekananda a very great Rishi. And a Rishi is an individual on the highest planes of consciousness. And Baba himself visited the very place in the temple where Ramakrishna lived, the very room where he lived. Baba himself went there. Now, Vivekananda wrote this extraordinary statement about Ramakrishna, which I want to read to you because it's always apropos and very meaningful to anybody who wishes to unravel and discover the beauty of the presence of God within. And this is what this is about. This is what Vivekananda says. And then he begins to mention what his master, who is Ramakrishna, says. Extreme love of God is bhakti. And this love is the real immortality, getting which one becomes perfectly satisfied sorrows for no loss, and is never jealous, knowing which one becomes mad. My master used to say, quote, this world is a huge lunatic asylum where, <laughs> where all men are mad, some after money, some after sex, some after name or fame, and a few after God. I prefer to be mad after God. God <clears throat> is the philosopher's stone that turns us to gold in an instant. The form remains, but the nature is changed. The human form remains, but no more can we hurt or sin. Thinking of God, some weep, some sing, some laugh, some dance, some say wonderful things, but all speak of nothing but God. Bhakti cannot be used to fulfill any desires, itself being the check to all desires. Narada, Narada was the disciple of Krishna. Narada gives these as the signs of love. When all thoughts, all words, and all deeds are given up unto the Lord, and the least forgetfulness of God makes one intensely miserable, then love has begun. Mm -hmm. This is the highest form of love, because in it there is no desire for reciprocity, which desire is found in all human love. A man who has gone beyond social and scriptural usage is a sannyasin. When the whole soul goes to God, when we take refuge only in God, then we know that we are about to get this love. When the sun of love begins to break on the horizon, we want to give up all our actions unto God, and when we forget him for a moment, it grieves us greatly. Day and night think of God, and as far as possible think of nothing else. The daily necessary thoughts can all be thought through God. Eat to him, drink to him, sleep to him, see him in all. Talk of God to others. This is most beneficial. That was Vivekananda. So I put something together here, um, just to conclude. Oh, about what Baba had said about giving everything to him, disburdening ourselves of all of our wanting, and surrendering everything. <clears throat> uh, I 
call this accessing the divine within. The process of replacing in oneself lower by higher values, Meher Baba calls the process of sublimation. And this is a quote from Baba. Sublimation consists of diverting the psychic energy locked up in sanskaras or impressions towards spiritual ends." End quote. What becomes wonderfully possible in this is an ongoing personal communion with the sacred within one. For those of us who are connected to Meher Baba, he is the personification of the sacred beloved within each one of us and becomes our companion in this most important venture. So the prevailing thoughts or impressions which have been inherited over the vast course of time have shrouded our consciousness like mists obscuring the subtle image of the distant mountains. These mists can be lifted, they can come to disappear, and those mountains can wonderfully reappear through the practice of more preoccupation, more communion with what eventually becomes known to one as the friend, the divine beloved, the companion. For me, Meher Baba symbolizes this companion, this beloved, and he has told us that he is none other than what you and I really and truly are behind the facade of this separate existence. As this relationship with the companion begins to instill itself within us, a wish for detachment emerges, and the urgency of earthly wanting is sublimated into a spiritual longing. One becomes more and more aware that self-interest has estranged us from the sacred, resulting in a prevailing anguish and grief over this ensuing alienation. Our one focus becomes the desire to discover, to witness, and to realize our oneness with the great beauty of this divine love, this divine beloved. Meher Baba has said, quote, the beloved can only be found within you, for his only abode is the heart. Who walks in singleness of heart shall be my companion. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. It was wonderful to share the richness of Tom's book, which is coming from Canada as we speak. It's arriving in Myrtle Beach soon. And I'm just thanking you all for celebrating this Tom's life and love for Baba and his connection with Mayor Baba. It's meant a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for putting all this together. It's nice to be introduced <laughs> to a book so thoroughly. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Good to see you all. Thank yeah, you. Kathy. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, yeah. Greg and Joyce and for reading and Greg Butler for all this techno work and everybody else who here who I see loves Tom. Oh, Kevin, you have to say something with an Irish accent before we go. <laughs> <Of course. clears throat> Every time. I would uh, bump into Tom on the uh, center. My, my my greeting to him would be, Oh, Jesus, Mary and Holy St. Joseph, did they let you out of the house now? <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, have you not been, don't you have one of those ankle bracelets, for God's sakes? <laughs> <laughs> I bet, you know, <clears throat> I actually, you know, heard Tom speak when I got here. I've been here for 21 years. I don't know when it was. And the first time I met Tom was, you know, giving a talk at the center. 
And of course I walked over to him and, you know, with that high regard of you know, someone who met Baba and just amazed by you know, his storytelling and all that. And I don't know how long it was, but you know, like shortly thereafter, I don't know, I, I guess I crossed over the line first. I don't know what possessed me to be so brazen to talk to him that way. But he responded, this is the thing that's amazing about Tom. He just responded as if we were like together our whole entire life. And then he asked me, you know, so where's your family from in Ireland? And the whole Irish connected connection became, uh, you know, like the the avenue through which I wound up having the the incredible uh, gift of uh, being friends with him. I mean, you know, he he treated me like an older brother out of nowhere. Like it went from I don't know you to we've been together forever in a minute. And then in large measure, thanks to you, Kathy, uh, who precipitated any number of meetings at the house. Um, the thing I would have to say about Tom, I, I know we're all over time here, but uh, he was, uh, aside from all the things everybody else said, you know, a master in so many different disciplines of life, I believe he, he was his, his, his single greatest you know, mastery aside from his love for Baba was just how he can make anybody, me specifically, feel like we were long lost brothers and uh, be so utterly natural and embracing. Uh, and, you know, I recall the first few times I was over at the house with Kathy that I was, you know, like, a little nervous, you know, <laughs> like what it would say, you know, how's it going to be? And it, it was never like that. Um, and as the years went by, uh, call it, I don't know, Kathy, you probably can figure out when it all started, uh, eight or nine years. Um, it was, uh, and of course, Baba was always present in it. And there was, uh, you know, periodically, as somebody else said, you know, ref oh, uh, <clears throat> I guess your name is Greg, the build guy. You know, but I just, I, I'm just so, I'm, I'm happy that you are, that you did this. Kathy, but frankly, it's making me uh, sad. <laughs> I really miss him. Jay Bob. Yeah, that's, we're happy and remembering and trying not to be sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember before saying goodbye, I have to say one of my greatest gifts from Kevin is uh, hearing him say to Tom once with that Irish accent, that Tom was one of the, the uh, well, promote, not promoters, but the greatest raconteurs and that he never let, what was that Irish saying? Never let the truth. Oh, yes, it is a, it is a known Irish saying. Oh, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> the other one he and I enjoyed was also an Irish saying. All you have in life is this moment, and your story. So on that happy note, Jay Baba. <laughs> Jay Baba. Jay Baba, thank you everybody. Avatar Meher Baba, Key Jay. Avatar.